So scaling design and design organizations can be a mountain, from collaborating across multiple locations to seeking efficiency and quality across an organization. There are challenges at every corner. We hope that some of the insight today can help uh, solve some of these problems in your own organizations. Shipra Kayan, formerly the UX Director of Upwork, uh, Peter Molholtz, the author and consultant, and Amy Thibodeau, our very own uh, UX Director and Head of UX Operations at Shopify, and Ann Purvis will all be speaking today. So first up, let's welcome Sherpa Kayan to the stage, the former UX Director at Upworks. She's been a UX strategist for over 15 years and has facil facilitated over 100 remote design workshops. Most recently, she was the Director at Upwork, leading the company's transition towards embracing design thinking and design sprints as part of the product development process. And she's here to talk about building a strong UX culture within distributed teams. Right, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks, thanks Jen, thanks Shopify for hosting us. This has been the most incredible conference so far. It's so rare to be in a place surrounded by peers and be able to talk about the tough parts of management, especially managing designers. Really excited to be here with you guys today. Um, so yeah, I'm the remote design team on a video call person. Uh, this is me. My name is Shipra. It's like ships and boats. Uh, and I was at this company called Upwork, which is a freelancing marketplace for almost a decade um, and sort of grew the design and research culture there. Uh, as of the last six months, I've been a, a, an independent remote design thinking coach for want of a better name, design thinking. So when I started Upwork 10 years ago, we, I was the first UX person. We were a small product and design team, and we were all sitting in the same office in the Bay Area, in California. We then merged with another company just about 30 miles away. And so now we had a design team of nine spread out across two offices. And this is when we first started experiencing scale problems. Um, of course, part of it was that we grew from four to nine in a day. Uh, but then also we now had two offices and we saw all of those uh, alignment and visibility issues that Anne was talking about earlier. Uh, but we were still growing. Our business was literally doubling year over year. And we were trying to hire really fast. And in the Bay Area, for um, any of you who've been there, I think also probably in Toronto, in many of these urban centers, hiring was hard. You could not hire top talent uh, unless you were like one of the sexiest companies around, right? Uh, like Airbnb, yeah, they got top talent, but it was really hard for us to hire, uh, hire top talent. We decided to embrace what we were selling, which was remote work on, uh, as part of our business, embrace that as part of our design team, and we started hiring remotely. We hired uh, a design director in LA. We hired a, a really, really, fabulous junior designer in Atlanta. Uh, we even brought in a VP of design into our San Francisco office who moved after six months to Arizona. So now we had a design executive that was not at headquarters, right? So we started really seeing our team become more and more hybrid and, um, <clears throat> and about a third of our team was not in one of the main offices. It was around this time that we also decided to switch from building what the CEO asked us to build to actually following a human-centered design process. Um, and part of my role at this point became uh, sort of integrating, teaching people how to, to utilize design thinking methods and follow user uh, human-centered design or user-centered design. And the first thing I did was I hired a, a really great design coach to come in and train everyone, train our legal department, train our engineering department. And, and she came in and she was like, uh-uh, you can't do this stuff remotely. I'm not stepping into this. And I was like, I was really at a loss because we had the budget, uh, we had a team that was really raring to go, and there was no one to show us how to do it. So we built a practice. We 
built a practice internally at Upwork to spread sort of the design thinking methods. And a lot of my talk today is gonna to talk about that. Uh, as part of, oops. All right, anyway. <laughs> now that you've seen my kid, I'll just show you my kid. <laughs> about six months ago, I left Upwork. <laughs> Um, there are a couple of things that happened uh, in my personal life. I had a kid, and we went public, and there was a time for self-reflection. Uh, at the time, I, I, I asked myself, when is it that I feel fully utilized at work? And I realized it was when I was facilitating um, a workshop, a design workshop. And so that's what I do now full time. I work with all sorts of different uh, distributed teams not just distributed design teams, just companies, even if they don't have designers, to help them uh, integrate design thinking into their process. The other thing I wanna just point out before I move on to some of the methods is that a lot of times when people think about remote work, they think about this millennial in Bali, like kind of living the best life. <laughs> like that's really not the type of people we hired or the people that we worked with. Like these are just like regular people working out of a home office, extremely talented, ambitious, their kids are in daycare. And so many of these folks actually don't eat lunch. They just eat like energy bars every like two hours. Um, so yeah, if you have remote team members, like please send them like DoorDash coupons or whatever it is, like <laughs> get them to, yeah, they don't eat lunch. Um, so I know, I know that there is resistance within the design community to this idea of doing design remotely and design on a video call, right? Where we say things like, oh, it might work for engineering or customer support, but it doesn't work for design. That's not how design happens, right? We know that asynchronous work is really good for ICs, right? Especially like designers like to have that uh, period of time to focus and get in the flow. But design is also very physical, it's visceral. You whiteboard, you put storyboards up on walls, and there's war rooms full of post-its and design studios every week. It's so visible, it's so physical. Isn't it dehumanizing to do this online? I wanna chip away at a little bit of this resistance and talk about design tools. I wanna to talk a little bit about team culture. How do you keep a remote design team motivated and together? Um, and I'm gonna end with a few things about company culture, uh, how you as design leaders can influence it, and how Upwork allowed us to do this. So I'm gonna start with design tools and really focus on design studios, design critiques, design workshops, the sorts of things um, that, that we find, we imagine is really, really hard to do on a video call. Uh, this is a general toolkit um, that we would use at Upwork. I'm gonna assume most of you are familiar with, with many of these. Um, if you haven't, I'm just curious, how many of you have used online whiteboards like Miro or Miro? Yeah, everyone's pretty familiar with it. Yeah, very typical toolkit. Um, eventually, we also invested in Apple iPads with pens um, to make remote whiteboarding uh, available. I can show you some examples of what that looks like. But that was um, an, a, a significant investment in design tools. Uh, to make the remote team uh, kind of work and collaborate better. So I wanna talk about a few ways in which uh, we used some of these tools, just to give you a few stories from the field. So starting with design workshops. A lot of design workshops that we did were not just with designers, right? It was with product people, with legal, with engineers, operations, marketing. It was all of these like cross-functional folks coming together to do the divergence and convergence that design asks us to do in a remote setting. And the key to this really is structure, right? So the one thing, the one overarching theme in managing remote teams is that the best practices are the same as the ones for in-person teams. The best practices for remote workshops are the same as the ones for in-person workshops. You just have to be more disciplined about it. I think when we're in-person, we kind of slide by with like bad meeting practices, but when you're remote, it's really hard to do that. So go into a remote meeting and say something like, all right, everyone just like, just shout out. Uh, what do you think is wrong with our process today? Like that's really hard. That's really hard in a remote setting. 
Um, so I'm going to give one example. I'm not going to talk about all the facilitation techniques because uh, there's hundreds and a lot of people in this room have probably um, employed a lot of them. But one formula that we use a lot in uh, critiques or brainstorms or whatever is like you do some work alone, right, sketch alone. That's kind of easy to imagine doing remotely. And then you critique in pairs, right? And that's really hard. When you're in person, it's so easy to like go off into a corner and break out into pairs, but it's hard to imagine doing it remotely. Um, and then you might come back and prioritize and share in a circle. So we're just gonna take this um, example and see how we might do this remotely. Uh, the, the, the breakouts, what, what the best kind of tool that allowed us to do this was Zoom. Um, and uh, like I'm hoping other video tools start having more facilitator uh, features, but Zoom uh, lets you, I, I have, have people used Zoom breakouts? A few, yeah, oh my God, it's game changing, right? Like you just click a button, you tell it how many rooms you want it to make, and then it automatically puts people out into this little um, branch uh, of their own video call. And as the facilitator, you can jump in and out of these mini rooms, you can call people back, you can broadcast a message and say, it's time to switch. Um, it's, it's really cool. So we used Zoom a lot. Now the problem is, how do you do this when you have a hybrid team, right? So you have three people in the office, three people on a video call. For any substantial workshop that was more than half a day, I would have people work from home <laughs> and not come into the office. And that actually was like way more engaging and way more productive than having half the team in the office. Uh, but that's not always possible. I started all of my weekly team meetings with breakouts of two so people could get to know each other and just like have a conversation. And for that, uh, people were just got used to bringing their phones, logging into Zoom, walking out into a corner for the 10 minute breakout and coming back into the room. So really like we absorbed Zoom whether or not we were remote or in the office, it was just a way of working. Um, also, most of our, um, most of our uh, kind of the, these kind of remote meetings, which were working meetings, we didn't share our screen. We did not share our screen. We would have the, whatever, the video conference grid on one screen, and then we would have our working doc on the other screen. And with um, whiteboards like Mural, it sounds like everyone's been using them. Uh, you, you guys know that you, if you click on one of these faces, you can then pan and zoom into the part of the screen that person is looking at. So there's really no need to share your screen. We did the same thing with Google Docs. We would just follow along. So anyone, you know, you could work, you could be working in your working doc and then look, um, also glance at the faces of people when you were talking. Um, the other cool thing about uh, these online whiteboards is you can like uh, ask it to like show you the cursors of all the people. And as a manager, it was a really uh, great insight for me to see the energy of my team. Who's interacting? Who's not interacting? What are they saying? Uh, those were uh, some really great ways to gauge the energy of every person on your team, even though you're not seeing them. <clears throat> uh, these are just some examples of what a structure might look like before a workshop after a workshop. It sounds like a lot of you have used these tools, so I'm not gonna go into too many details. Um, really still believe in Sharpies and paper and sketching, so we did a lot of sketching, uploading, um, and then highlighting. Uh, the one thing I will pause to say is that some of these things may seem kind of unnatural the first time you look at it, even the first time you try it. Uh, but it really becomes habit. And one thing that was, that the story I have about that is we introduced these tools at Upwork uh, and we invited all these like people like lawyers and product managers to come in and brainstorm and uh, you know frame problems and all of that. And about three months into sort of us rolling out these practices at the company, that I was in this meeting where everyone, I was facilitating this workshop where everyone was in, a, in the same room and one of the PMs was like, wait a second, we're not using, we're not using Miro? And I'm like, no, we're all here. Like, let's use Post-its and Sharpies. And he's like, no, but I, you know, it, it's so nice with Miro because you get a document trail later. Like, can we just use Miro? And I was really surprised. I was like, really? <laughs> but, but it became so much, it's like, you know, the first, when you move from Sketch to Figma, 
the first second might be weird, but like after 30 minutes, you get used to it. And people really got used to this uh, form factor. Um, and then when, whenever we were all distributed and we were doing heads down time together, we would get on a video call and just play music. Um, and I know some of us do it for in-person workshops. It's really nice to do it for remote workshops. It creates a shared sensory environment where everyone just kind of feels like they're in the same space jamming along. But people tell me, <laughs> it's so hard to have impromptu whiteboard sessions. You know, in the office, I just look up, make eye contact, and then I'm just like, hey, I'm stuck. Can you help? Right? And that's so hard to do remotely. And it is. It is, right? The hey, have a moment. And the way I would say, like, where I think there's some cutting edge tools that are working on sort of presence, um, like constant presence for remote teams and all of that. There's nothing out there that I've liked. But we just use Slack. And the way I normalized this within the remote team was by doing it myself. I would go into our team channel and be like, hey, guys, I'm stuck. Does anyone have five minutes? Just DM me or ping me, and let's get on a video call. It was just a habit that we had to make. I can talk a little bit about more structured uh, team meetings that we also had to add to make sure we were making room for these. Um, but then it was, we, we also normalized the behavior of just asking for help. <clears throat> and then once you did that, we also used kind of Apple iPads and Apple Pens uh, for sketching. And if you guys haven't used it, these online whiteboards have great iPad apps now. It's seamless and super great. These are just a couple of examples of, um, of workshops where we sketched um, as well as used Post-its. So that's all about design tools. Happy to take questions later. But also, like part of managing a remote team is thinking through team culture. And for me, this boiled down to our, our remote employees on the design team getting promoted as much as employees who are in the office, right? We, what we didn't want to do was create like a, a two, two class system where remote employees had, you know, kind of less access in general. Um, and so this ensured that I, because I held myself accountable to this metric, it ensured that I was thinking about having the remote employee uh, be, be, you know, making sure they, they had a juicy project, making sure they had FaceTime with executives, uh, and making sure just in general that they were visible. Um, one issue with remote, our remote team was that people didn't know. So going back to the visibility problem that Anne was talking, this is actually, Anne, Anne showed this example already. She said we were talking, they do visual, visual stand-ups, visual something like that, visual stand We call them visual stand-ups. So every week uh, we had our, we started when we were nine design team members. Each design team member would just put a picture, um, what they were working on. It was the same meeting. It was like no, no kind of discussions. It was just about visibility. However, um, our team had a culture. We, we, we engendered a culture of commenting. So then, remember, we're not sharing screens. Each designer goes for one minute on, their, um, on what they're working on this week. And then we, we had a lot of people comment, right? Other designers comment on where they saw synergies or overlaps. And what tended to happen after these meetings was, you know how like when you get out of a meeting from a room, like people break off into pairs and start chatting? Uh, we saw that even after our remote meetings, right? So people who were commenting or found synergies would slack each other immediately after and um, hop on a video call. So this was um, kind of one way to keep visibility going. And like um, Anne said, we, we started when we were nine designers. I was still going strong when, when I left and we were at about 40 designers and researchers. Um, it was still useful at a team that scale. The other kind of fun things we did uh, was just uh, focus. I know icebreakers sound like whatever, hokey or whatever, but in team meetings, when you're like just seeing the top half of someone, it's really fun to like just 
get something personal. So for instance, just asking people to snap a picture of their feet, which was usually funny because like people didn't, people only dressed their top half a lot of times. Um, I mean, they were, they were close. I mean, sometimes, whatever. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, also started every sort of weekly team meeting with a 10 minute uh, breakout in pairs and just talk for 10 minutes and come back. Um, one actually un, uh, sort of a weird advantage of having a remote team was I saw fewer cliques, like fewer, this is the cool crowd, that's not the cool crowd in my remote teams uh, compared to what I'd experienced when we had in-person teams. Uh, uh, you know, N equals one, but it was uh, actually a little bit more democratizing to have everyone be remote. But I would let Zoom pick who got paired up for the day. Uh, for me, this is, I'm not suggesting everyone does this, but for me, the way I show appreciation is by writing a card, like I still do that. So for my remote team members, I would do the same thing, like send a card, send an Amazon gift certificate, um, send whatever like stuff when they did a good job and don't like not forgetting to celebrate those moments, um, even though I couldn't take them out for a drink. Um, also kind of something that's non-intuitive is for one-on-ones, a lot of times, especially once I had a rapport built up, uh, we would do it on the phone and not on a video call. I think there's something about a video call that feels almost confrontational when you're like staring into each other's faces. Um, and when you're on a computer, you're, you're looking at work. So a lot of what um, I would do is just be like, okay, we've been sitting in front of our computers, just put on some headset, uh, your headset and like go for a walk. And those sometimes tended to be like the deepest, most meaningful conversations I had with my directs was when we were, we were both like physical and walking and outside. And I, yes, I fired someone on a video call, right? That's hard. Um, and that, I mean, actually, it's both, there's both pros and cons. And the way I did it was I prepared, like when you let someone go in at any time, shouldn't be a surprise, right? They have, they read their review, they are coming in prepared, have the meeting, give them my phone number, give them phone number of any sort of um, other resources that the company provides, any mental health resources, whatever they might need, pre-set up a meeting with HR, you know, tell them to take the rest of the day off and reflect, all of that that you would do if you were letting someone go in person. But what was the most, the most awkward part of doing that was again like that we were on a video call and we were sh staring at not only each other's faces, but also our own faces as we were reacting to this really difficult conversation. Um, I don't have any tips for that. I just, it was just the most like awkward setting to do that in. I feel like in a conference room, you're sitting side by side or at right angles. It feels a little bit less confrontational. However, the person, and we're, we're in touch um, now. The person told me later that at least I didn't have to walk out the door with a box. And I realized like the hardest part of being let go is actually what you're gonna tell people in the aftermath and walking out of that room. And this person had the privacy of their own home. So not saying it's better, but it, that was it. Uh, <laughs> And then we had on-site off -site. so we had off-sites, right? We, got, we flew everyone in every quarter, just like Anne said, and I'm referencing Anne a lot. We have to talk Anne later. But we flew everyone in, and the story I wanna share here is, is initially our instinct, or my instinct was, everyone's here, let's get a lot of work done. Right? Let's like do all those, these workshops, let's solve all these problems, let's brainstorm or whatever. And what I realized was we were actually pretty good at doing that remotely. Uh, but what we weren't getting remotely were those one hour long lunch conversations uh, where those friendships form. And there's a lot of data showing that personal friendships at work uh, are correlated to retention. And so we 
uh, flipped, completely flipped. We didn't workshop any of our uh, offsites. We'd fly people in during San Francisco Design Week. Uh, we'd have no agenda, really, that was work-related. It was just time for us to get to know each other and be designers together and forget about Upwork for a week. Just a couple more points about company culture and then we'll take questions. <clears throat> So I was really lucky to be doing this at a company that prided itself on being remote first. We really weren't. We weren't remote first, but we wanted to be. And what that let me do was give VPs or SVPs feedback when they weren't being remote first, like when they were crinkling a bag of chips at the microphone where someone was remote or trying to collaborate by drawing on the whiteboard and turning the camera to face the whiteboard. I could sit them down and give them feedback on how that wasn't working. So that was really, really good. However, not everyone has that, um, that kind of uh, scaffolding in place. And so I, I, I think it's just, as I've seen other companies try and do it, it's very hard if you don't have executives that believe that we, we, you, that you need to go remote. Um, the one kind of interesting thing that started happening though, once we started using Miro, was that it became onboarding for new employees around the company. Um, so with being remote, documentation is key, key, key. Everything has to be written down. You can't have tribal knowledge. Um, and we had this rule of no private data sets. Uh, but what ended up happening was that our workshops uh, became uh, such a good way to understand how the team thought, how the company made decisions, that every time we now had new employees, they would just go to Miro, to the recent boards, and check it out. And that was how they onboarded, and that was just kind of part of the ethos from day one, was this is how we work, this is how we collaborate. So, yeah, I'm not here to tell you that this is easy, or you should do this tomorrow. But I do wanna say that the next time you get a chance to lead a remote team or if you are leading a remote team and you're not kind of feeling like it can work, I just hope that today you can take away a little bit of confidence that it can work and that there are methods and tools that you can use. Yeah, that's it. There we go. Okay, we have some online questions as well, and then I'll come and pass the microphone around. Um, so first of all, how do you manage efficiency in design and collaboration questions when people are across different time zones? Yeah. Um, so I can uh, address the time zones first. Uh, we, uh, we had engineers spread across time zones, not designers. Uh, well, we had designers spread across three time zones, but not you know, on the other side of the world. Uh, we definitely had overlaps. Um, when we did workshops, for instance, when we did design sprints, we would do uh, two hours together and then have the rest of it be asynchronous homework. Um, and it, it is kind of, uh, obviously you don't get, you don't get your questions answered immediately. So if you're an engineer, you're stuck, you wanna ask the designer something, it's really hard to get immediate responses. But it also, I think, as a result, we were a little bit more thoughtful in our documentation. Um, and we were OK with commenting, like Google Docs comments or Jira comments. We were very used to like this asynchronous mode of communication. We did have two-hour overlaps. The design and engineering teams would have uh, daily stand-ups, very similar to what some of your companies do. Um, efficiency, I'm not sure, um, was there a specific question around efficiency or just how do you handle efficiency? How do you manage efficiency? Yeah, I mean, if, if yeah, I think if, if that was related to the fact that you can't quickly get a response, um, it's just we, I think we organically shifted towards being more thoughtful in our documentation. That's the best. 
Yeah. Okay, I have some more online ones, but also feel free to raise your hand and I'll come over. Would you say remote work is more costly? Flying people in, collaborative tool license, et cetera. Why or why not? Yeah, I live in San Francisco. So no, like for our company, <laughs> it is not more costly. Um, the tools are an investment. Uh, they're more than worth it. And uh, I, I, I also think, I think for us, for us, when we move to remote work, I think there, there are some companies that think about the cost cutting as, as a reason. Um, I think overall for us, we just couldn't hire in the Bay Area anymore at the speed that we needed to hire. So yeah, it was not more costly, but also like it was so much faster to get stuff done. How do you convince a remote unfriendly organization to consider remote work? <laughs> you know, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I actually like after having tried to do a lot of things bottom up, I have come to realize that there has to be like, there has to be some philosophical alignment at the top of the chain. So if you have a CEO or if you have like a head of product that's saying, oh no, remote work is not gonna work, it's, it's really hard. I would say like have them talk to the head of product at Envision and see how they do it and like see if that convinces them or show them examples of other like really top high quality products that have been built, designed and built by remote teams. Uh, What was the reduction in time to hire with remote hires? Yeah, um, oh my gosh, uh, I, don't, I don't remember the exact number, but it was drastic. Like if it, it was taking us six months to a year to fill a rack in the office, um, it would take us a month. Uh, and we didn't like, we did not lower our standards. Um, that that uh, metric about remote promotions, we, by the time I left, we were promoting our remote folks more, not because they were remote, but they were like really, really good. They were really, really good. Are there additional success, success metrics to keep in mind or monitor for remote team? Yeah. <clears throat> so these are not, uh, for sure we, I cut everything. So we did Glint surveys, which are employee engagement surveys. I'm sure you guys do um, do some version of that. I would cut everything, you know, like you cut it by gender, you cut it by like, you know, like making sure you're looking at minorities. I cut it by remote, remote workers or not. So every, almost every HR metric that we were tracking as managers, I would cut that. Uh, but the other, actually the, the, the thing that I didn't figure out how to operationalize by the time I left that I would have loved to operationalize was like the number of uh, kind of the voice, like how much voice do you have as a remote person? Um, and how can we equalize the amount of voice, the amount you're presenting, the amount of time you have with executives, all of that. Those were things I was thinking about, but I didn't operationalize. If anyone else has any ideas, by the way, this is a discussion. I'm sure like I can learn from a lot of you, so feel free to raise your hand. And yeah, jump in. Yeah, for sure. Um, so one of the worst interviews I ever had was a remote interview call, and I was totally unprepared for it. And so I came off really poorly. And so you guys are all ace ninjas at doing it. So what do you do when you are interviewing people to make sure that they're comfortable with the process because they're probably not as good at it as you? Yeah, yeah, that's, oh my gosh, yes. I made a packet. And, and the first thing on it was make sure your bed is not visible on the video camera. And not because like I understand a lot of people like you're taking a call from your room, I get it, or from a hotel room, but like just making sure you are visible <laughs> and your background is like kind of, yeah, safe for work is. <laughs> so, uh, but that, I mean, that's like such a like tactical one, but for a lot of people, that immediate trustworthiness at first glance, like that really matters. Um, obviously, the tools, uh, you know, for, for design interviews especially, 
there is usually a whiteboard task, right? Uh, and that's much harder because I don't expect every interviewee to have like an Apple iPad with pencil. Uh, we uh, did a lot of those in Google Docs or in uh, formats that uh, an interviewee might have used before. Um, so allowing people to write instead of sketch um, um, or giving people some time to sketch and then share their screens. So we were, we were very, um, we were very aware of that. We were also aware of like not having that bias. Uh, we, so we tried really hard <laughs> to not reject someone uh, because their lighting was off and we couldn't see their face or whatever. <laughs> what are some of the best practices for structuring remote meetings with cross-functional teams that would traditionally be more open-ended in free form if in person? Yeah, yeah, so any, any, so Atlassian actually um, has this thing, if you just search for Atlassian playbook, they have a bunch of plays, which is like basically design thinking activities that you can do. Um, like just even like things that we do in the design, like even in a brainstorm, you have people, you know, reflect, write something down, put it up, group it, affinity it, that's always a good structure. Um, and finally, like the one that we employed a lot, even with our board, was um, sort of the Amazon memo structure. Have people read something, absorb it, and then come back and have a structured guided discussion. We also always, uh, for any substantial remote meeting that wasn't just a presentation or, you know, sometimes you just have someone giving you some technical information that you need to know. You don't have to structure that. but. Uh, if it was like any kind of a structured discussion, we always had a facilitator. And my team, I groomed them to be facilitators. We, we had all of our researchers uh, get facilitator training and be really, really good at facilitating. OK, I think we have time for two more. I have one more online. So think of your best question, and I'll come find you. Do you have any suggestions for conducting meetings where, mem where part of the members are remote and others are in person? Yeah, yeah, so um, depends on how long the meeting is. Um, <clears throat> so if it is a, a real substantial workshop that's half a day, one day, two days, five days, um, I would ask people to either work from home or uh, book a small conference room at work. And so then what you're doing is you're kind of creating the space where there are no side conversations and everybody's using the same toolkit, right? Everyone's using the Google Doc or Miro board or whatever, whatever it is that you decided. Um, I think the hardest part about hybrid meetings is that people in the room have side conversations, start scribbling and drawing or whiteboarding and like imagining that the people remote will see it. Um, so that doesn't work. I think if it's a shorter meeting, having everyone use the same tools and having a set of norms. We had a page of norms that we, were, we had printed out in every conference room. It included things like uh, log in to the meeting and share your camera. So like, again, like Anne said, like, so people can see your face and not just like people who are remote are not seeing a big room. No side talks, no talking over each other, um, no opening bags of potato chips uh, or, or popping cans of soda because it's really, when you're remote, it's really annoying. Uh, we had all of our leadership take meetings remotely uh, very, very uh, constantly. So like kind of how Jared said two hours, two exposure hours to users every six weeks. We had this rule of like everyone needs to take meetings remotely, even executives, so they understand what it's like uh, to be the remote participants. So it was very much part of our company culture uh, to uh, to create a share, like a supportive environment. Yeah. Sorry, I have one quick question. Um, so we're trying to bring on new hires where leadership may be remote. Is, do you have any advice to give to someone coming into the company who's never worked remote before and make them comfortable with that atmosphere? Yeah. Um, so I would say the hardest, this is like probably not the easiest to do, but the most effective is for them to be on site for the first month or two months um, and then go back remotely. Um, hopefully they have other people as a support group within the company who also work remotely. So we had a remote, just like, you, you know, we had, uh, you know, uh, 
groups for moms or uh, African Americans. We also had a group for remote folks um, to kind of be supportive for each other and advocate for themselves. Um, so hopefully the company has some structures, but uh, like just flying out, making some of those connections, depending on how hybrid your team is, is really important. Well, thank you so much, Shabra. That was really, really interesting. Thank you so much. I think we all learned a lot. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks. <laughs>